Samuel chapter 16. We're going to read verses 1 through 13. It says, And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil, and go, I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite. For I have provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with thee, and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do, and thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. And Samuel did that which the Lord spoke, and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming, and said, Comest thou peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves, and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons, and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass, when they were come, that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature. I want you to notice that. He said, Don't look on the height of his stature the way that he looks, because I have refused him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. That's important for you to see that. The Lord doesn't see things the same way that man sees things. For man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse made Shammah to pass by. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, are here all thy children? And he said, there remains yet the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, send and fetch him. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him. And I, I thank you for the privilege, Lord, that you have called me to be a, a mouthpiece, to speak your word, Lord God. I pray that you would use me as a vessel, Lord, and that you would speak your word, Lord, that you would anoint it, Lord, that it would accomplish what you've called it to do, Lord. You said through the prophet Isaiah that your word would not return unto you void, but that it would accomplish that which you send it forth to do. Lord, sometimes we see it immediately. Sometimes we don't see it right away. But Lord, I believe that we will see it. Lord, allow your word to go forth and to cause the change in each and every one of our lives. Those that watch on video, Lord, whatever we're going through, Lord, you see because you desire to do a work, Lord, for your kingdom. Lord God, we just pray that you would cause it to come to pass in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, look, so uh, this morning, my message that, that I'm talking about, it, it has to do with bread. I don't know. Do you like bread? I'll tell you what, man. I could probably eat bread. I could, I, I could really make, make a mess of myself if I sat there and just let myself eat bread. I, I think I'm wondering if my title was working for me, but uh, I believe that in the end that the title works because you see, the question is who is baking your bread? Is it you or is it God? Amen. And so I, I'm going to explain to you here in a moment where I'm getting the concept of bread from right here. Let's go ahead and read verse one again. And the Lord said unto Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul? Seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel, fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. There's a lot of words that stick out to me right there, but that Bethlehemite, I kind of highlighted that for you. And that's really where I'm getting my title from. I might not even go back there a whole lot today, but I want you to know, and many of you already know, that the word Bethlehem literally means house of God. And so I want you to know that God's baking bread. Amen. I want you to know that God's baking bread. And listen, the concept of bread for Israel is, is very central to their provision. 
You see, what they needed. See, their, 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 their diet consisted a lot regarding bread. They would produce bread from wheat. It was a, it was a, you know, life is a lot different now. You just go over to the store and you kind of, back in, I remember when I was a kid in Lafayette, we had Evangeline made right up the road. And I can remember going through the stores and that was the softest okay. bread. Anyway, God, God, that was their provision. That was their sustenance. And, and look, it's a beautiful thing. And I'm not really getting into it this morning, but that Jesus was bread from heaven. God provided manna for his children. God provides. You see that word right there? For I have provided me a king among his sons. Amen. Listen, there's a lot of backstory to this. You got in the story, you got Saul, you have young David we're dealing with here. So God, what was in their eyes, they did what they thought was right in their own eyes. They didn't have a king over them. And at some point in time, towards the end of the judges, I mean, time was, times were bad. Times were wicked. Listen. In America today, not just in America, but in the world today, the prevalent spirit that, that is speaking to the hearts of people. Now, we've talked about it before, but the book of Ephesians says that there's a spirit of disobedience. There's a spirit, a prince of the power of the air that works in the children of disobedience. Well, look, that spirit was alive then. It's the spirit of Antichrist. And he was working on the people of that time frame. And towards the end, the people cried out and they said, we want a king. They said, give us a king. Literally, they said, we want to be like the other nations. Give us a king. And so God told the prophet that my people have rejected me as king. So you can go ahead and give them the king that they're asking for. But he told them, he said, but you need to tell them. It's not going to be like what you thought. He's going to take your daughters and he's going to make them bake all of his stuff. He's going to make them make perfumes and, and whatever the case for them. He's going to take your sons and he's going to put them into battle. And, and, and there's going to be a big disruption and there's going to be a problem. You see, one of the things that we don't realize until later as we move through the Bible is that God was preparing a king. God was preparing a king for himself. He already had young David in the wait. Right. He had him in the field. The young David's heart was being prepared to be. And he was going to be a king. Hey, but God was preparing his heart as he was tending sheep. You see, and, and in this particular story, whenever God said, because Saul ended up doing was God, Saul was rebellious against the Lord. The Lord told Saul, I said, Saul. And Saul went down a spiral. Listen, sometimes we can't even realize how much a certain acts of disobedience will, will move us in a certain direction. We don't realize that it's that bad whenever we're first doing it because that's, that's a ploy of Satan. Satan is a master at deception. He's a master at smoke and mirrors. He's, a, he, he's an illusionist. And he makes things seem like they're not that bad. But Saul made a decision that began to cause him to go into a spiral to where the voice of God, he could not hear it anymore. And that's that whole story when he went to go visit that necromancer, the witch of Endor and all of that kind of stuff. And so God's presence was moving away from him. And he tells Samuel, remember in the, what we just read, he said, how long are you going to mourn for Saul? Take your, your horn, fill it with oil. And go anoint for me one of Jesse's boys. Now, he shows up to the to the scene. Now you got to remember the little. You remember the song, the, the little town Bethlehem. I, I I don't even remember the words, but you know what I'm talking about. It's talking about Jesus, right? It's talking about the birth of the Lord. It's a little town. Bethlehem's a little town situated about six miles. I think it's south of Jerusalem. A little bitty town, obscure, out of the way. Nobody really knows about it. But here's where Jesse live is in this little town called Bethlehem. And he says, he says, I want you to go over there and I want you to know I prepared a king for myself. And he said, well, that's going to cause a problem. So listen, you got to understand that it'd be kind of like if the president showed up to Morgan City, you know, <laughs> it'd be like, like a big deal. I mean, for the firstborn of Jesse. Okay. And when he comes to Iliad, we're, we're told in the word of God, what he's perceiving in his mind. And he says, surely this is the Lord's anointed right here. And, and the way that he determined that, and we're going to get into it a little bit deeper as we move along. The way he determined that was the way that he looked and the stature of his height. So what that means is that he was tall. 
And there, there's something behind that. We're going we're gonna to dig it out. But I want you to see that he sees him and he looks the part. But the Lord says, no, he's not the one. See, man looks at the outward, but I look at the heart. Now, I got to tell you that there's a lot of truth to that in our modern society, right? And listen, if we're honest with one another, we formulate perceptions on what we think based upon what society says. We're not supposed to. We're supposed to be led and guided by the word of God. I'm talking about as a child of God. You understand what I'm saying? As a child of God, born again, the word of God says that the spirit of God lives on the inside of us. And I got to tell you, I know I say it a lot, but the spirit of God is saying something completely different than the spirit of the world. God's perception of things is completely different than the world. You know, to the world, I'm just giving you some examples. To the world, a white stallion would present the concept of power. It would present the concept of of, you know, you know, just war and power and beauty. But yet Jesus, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, comes riding into town on a donkey. The, the, the Bible says that, that kings, the, the children of kings are born in palaces and kings wear silk and clothes. Yet Jesus, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, was born in a manger amongst stinky animals. The world says that, you know, and listen, if you drive a BMW, I'm not making fun of you, but I'm just trying to make a point. The world says a BMW dressed out with all the finest, uh, you know, leathers and gauges and all the stuff. The, the world says that the bigger the rock, the bigger the shine, the bigger the bling, the better it is. The world says that the way things look, man, you impress me, dude. Look at how you dress over there. Don't get, hey, listen. I like clothes, I like cars, I'm not trying to beat none of that up, but I'm just trying to make a point that we have been trained in our mind to look at what society says is cool and to follow suit. And the Lord's saying right here, we even way back in the Old Testament in ancient times, man looks at the outward appearance of things, but I'm here to tell you, God looks at the inside. He's seeing something. God is wanting to do a work on the inside inside of people and you'll never even understand it unless you get saved you need to understand well, what are you talking about preacher saved from what saved from the way you were born when you gushed forth in water out of your mother's womb that's what saved from the birth in adam which it will result in eternal damnation if you don't get born again that's what the word of god says i didn't write it i didn't make it up the Word of God says that the first time you and I were born, we were born of Adam who had fallen into sin. That means we're born into sin. That's why we must be born again. How are you born again? You hear the gospel that says that you were born a sinner. Amen. You hear the gospel, the good news that says God made a way. That the way that he made was Jesus. That Jesus died on the cross. For your sin and for my sin and the Holy Spirit, not, not the preacher. I wish it could be that easy. No, 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 no. I've been praying, Lord, please, you got to do the work. When I sat, I'm telling you, I know I've told you all this story because I can't forget it because it's my testimony. Back in that little church in Berwick, Louisiana, when that preacher, she kept saying, blood, blood, blood. And all of a sudden, I was getting all disturbed on the inside because the Holy Spirit was dealing with me. And at the same time, the demon spirits were contending with me, trying to get me to get up and get out because it's weird. Why did she keep saying blood? And then she said it because, see, the innocent one had to die in place of the guilty one because the word of God says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So you hear the gospel that says you're a sinner, but Jesus died for your sin, and you say, yes, Lord, I believe it. And listen, when you believe it from your heart, Romans chapter 10. When you believe it from your heart, not just your head, it's got to go from, now listen, you probably won't believe here till you believe here. You got to hear it. You got to know it. You got to kind of have some kind. You don't have to understand it in detail, but you got to realize a couple of things or else you might not even be saved. Can I say that to, to whoever might watch? There's people that probably sit in churches in the midst of this modern thing that we call Christianity that may not even be saved. And I don't say that ugly. I say that to, I say that to, to, I guess to 
poke and prod a little bit to get things to, to make us wonder and to question. Because I mean, you can believe something here, but if you haven't believed it here, see, it's when you believe it here that the change takes place. Amen. Amen. God's wanting to do an inward work. God's wanting to do something on the inside. Man's looking at the outside. God's doing the work on the inside. So anyway, we go through all of these sons and then we get to the end and it's like, is there another one? Because, oh yeah, but yeah, he's an afterthought, right? He's the young, he's the young teenage boy that's, that's in the field and he's, he's tending the sheep. And, you know, I just love to try to think the Bible doesn't say any of this, but if you understand the ancient culture, then some of this has to be true. He's out in the field tending the sheep. And he says, well, we'll fetch him. Now, yeah, I mean, I don't really know what that means. How do, how do you go fetch a, a fellow like that? I mean, how far away is he? You know, we, we're not told any of this. But, I mean, a shepherd, typically back in them, those days, they would, they would be out in the pasture. And I just imagined it that way in my mind. I got one of them chauffeurs in my in my room over there, but I don't know how to blow it. So, but it was a, but it was a ram. So this is how I imagine it. This is Matt's interpretation. Boop, boop. You know, you got one guy over here and then he get, boop, boop. and they, and they blow the horn and young David's ears perk up and he knows, oh, they're calling me. Daddy needs me back at, at town. So he, you know, and listen, I'm telling you right now, this guy was something. Okay. I can't prove it all, but I, I can tell you some of the, the picture that is painted about young David is that he has, he has, a, well, I don't know that his hair was long, but it, I believe it was red. Because, see, the Bible says he was ruddy in appearance. Look upon, meaning good looking. It says that his eyes were beautiful. And, and I know he was athletic because, I mean, he just bounced up in that valley of Elah and he picked him out some five smooth stones and then on the run, pop! He hit Goliath right between the eyes. Now, granted, I know that the Lord guided that rock like a missile right into the forehead of Goliath. I get that. But what I'm trying to say is, is that there was something about this, this young man. He was, he had the, the heart of a warrior. Okay. And he comes running in and I can just only imagine whenever he sees this big old crowd, this big old in the little town of Bethlehem, the prophet right here. And everybody's looking around and I mean, I think I'm going to preach on Goliath, the, the story of Goliath next week. But you can see in the story of Goliath that his older brother is frustrated. This is the next scene in the story because Eliab has been rejected. He's, he's the firstborn. You would have thought he'd have been the one. But the Lord said, no, I have refused him. And whenever David goes to battle, Eliab, you can tell he's like, I know what's in your heart. There's wickedness in your heart. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I think it's pretty obvious that the wickedness is in your heart, Iliad. You're full of jealousy and you're full of, you're, you're, you're full of a bunch of stuff that's not of the Lord. You're frustrated because, because you didn't. You're full of envy and, you, and you're frustrated because it didn't come to you, right? But anyway, young David shows up and there he is anointed to be king. What a, what a beautiful thought. You know, but, but, you know, too, and, and I didn't plan on getting into any of this, but whenever you think about the fact that David was anointed at some point but for quite some time and all of the things that he went through, all of the frustrations, Saul trying to kill him, so many different things happening to him in life. Um, you know, I think about the fact that many times the Lord has spoken things to me. And I know that the Lord has spoken things to you. And yet at the same time, it seems like, what is going on? You know what I mean? It seems like, what, what is going on, Lord? And, and you know, I got to tell you that, that God always allows a testing phase in our lives. And, and I, and I got to be honest with you. I kind of wish it wasn't so, but God's God and I'm just a little lump of clay. <laughs> and he's the potter. And I don't contend, I, by the grace of the Lord, I don't want to contend with the potter. He's, a, he's big enough to handle it if I tried to, but, but, but you understand. And, 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 and I got to understand that God allows testing to take place. One of the things that the Lord showed me before was, is that you think you're not going to be tested, son? My only begotten son came upon this earth. He said he was the son of God and he was tested by Satan himself. You walk around here on earth, call yourself Christian, which means to be like Christ, and you think you're not going to be tested? No, you're going to be tested. True believers are going to be tested. Amen? And in the end, the big, the big question is, 
will we have by faith held on to the Lord? And at some point in time, what I got to tell you is, we're about to move forward in the, in the message, is, is this, is that what God wants to do is he wants to bring you through whatever it is you've been facing. And listen, when he does, when he keeps in the victory that your heart has been crying out for, you know what's going to happen? Let me tell you what's going to happen. Your heart is going to be so overwhelmed with joy and gratitude towards God for his mercy and his grace Ain't nobody gonna have to cajole you to talk about the Lord. Talk about the Lord. He's gonna be the darling. He's gonna be the lover of your soul. You're gonna. He's gonna be the beloved of your mind. You're gonna. You're gonna. You're gonna he's gonna be the topic of your conversation. You know how high quarterbacks can jump and how fast running backs can run. That's gonna be. Like, you ain't gonna be worried about that. The motorcycles and cars and whatever. Can, no, no, no. Jesus is gonna be the topic of your conversation because. He will have proven himself to you. So I just want to encourage you to hang on, brothers and sisters. Hang on to the Lord. Cry out to God And whenever you know things aren't exactly the way that they are. So look, God's got a will. He said, I have provided for me a king. I want you to remember that part about how Israel said, we want a king. You know, let, let me just say, let me just harp on that just for a second. Because so many times, you know, I used to hear preachers talk about God's permissive will. And then I start, now that, now that I understand the word, I don't think God's got a permissive will. No, man's got a free will. That's really, God's got one will, and that's his, that now does he just throw us away whenever we go our own way? No, of course not. He works with us through this alternate pathway that we chose for ourselves. He's not going to leave us or forsake us. He, he loves us and he wants to work with us. But, but to say that God's got a permissive will, no, he's got a perfect will. God's got a perfect will for your life. Amen. But the children of Israel wanted what they wanted. And so God says, okay, give them what they want. They think this is what they want. Give it to them. But then the end result was frustration and aggravation and, and, and bondage of sorts. And I got to tell you that it's important you understand and that I understand that in today, you and I, many times... We want what we want, and that's what a lot of my message is about. We want what we want, and many times it's contrary to what God wants. Yeah. And when we choose what we want over what God wants, I promise you, it's going to create a problem. Yeah. Then the enemy is a master. Let me just go ahead and prepare your heart. The enemy is a master at flipping the script and trying to get your heart and mind to blame God. Yeah. When in reality, I'm not picking... I'm just telling you the truth. It was your fault. It was my fault for yeah. making the decision to yeah. begin with. So what we really need to know is how am I going to know the difference? At least that's what I believe. So point number one that I want to talk to you about is that God provides what you need. Or I could have put God provides what we need and God provides what he needs. Well, what are you talking about? Well, what I'm trying to say and I've been trying to say for quite some time is that there's a whole lot more going on on this rock we call earth than just your life and just my life, right? We're very egocentric. What does that mean? Ego, self, that's what the word ego means in the Greek is self, self-centered, very aware of self and, and my little bubble of life and everything that affects me. If I'm offended by someone else or if things don't go my way or the whole world, like a little, like kind of like a, is it okay if I say it? Like a toddler, like a little two-year-old in the whole world. And, and I'm just focused on myself. I don't even understand that, that, that thing, other things are going on. And many times I'm not trying to say, I know this is none of y'all. I'm just trying to say, this is what I've struggled with as an adult. So let me use myself as an example that, you know, the whole world should be revolved that I expect it to be done, I get offended. But what I need you to understand if you're going to come to this church from time to time is that God's doing something bigger than just your individual life. Now, what you get, what, what's so beautiful about this is he 
cares about you. He has the, the, the sparrow falls to the ground. How much more will he notice when you're going through the smallest of details? He wants you and I to go to him, not to something else, not to another relationship, not to drugs, not to alcohol, not to secular music, not to, listen, oh Lord, let me just stop. Not to anything else that's going to solace your soul other than his presence. That's what God wants for you. He wants to heal you. He wants to deliver you. You know why? Because he wants to make a warrior out of you. Well, what does a warrior look like? I'm going to come running in like ruddy old day. No, I'm going to take a sling and, and strike. Yeah, in the spirit. Spiritually speaking. Well, what does that look like, preacher? I got to stand behind a pulpit? No, no. What it means is God doing the work in you, slowly but surely, opening up opportunities for you to share your testimony, to, to understand. Listen, I'm either telling you the truth or I'm not. And what I'm trying to get across is, is that there's a spiritual war that's taking place. And the souls of men hang in the balance. That's either... Paul said we've war not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places against world rulers. So that's either true or it's not. And if that's true, then that means that these spiritual entities, if you will, have mankind bound up. Yeah. And, and some people don't even have a clue of where to go or what direction to move in. But yet God can strategically place you and I, once we're saved, once we care to be a disciple, once we care to learn about the things of God, and he will use you in the way that he made you. Amen. See, the way that he made me is one way, but the way he made you is, is, is going to look different. But he's still going to use us all the same. I hope that makes sense. See, God provides what you need. What is it that you need today? You know, like spiritually speaking. I mean, even like not just spiritually, but physically. He, God wants to move on your behalf. He wants you to be able to pay your bills. He wants you to be able to have a roof over your head. He wants you to have bread in your belly. He wants you to be taken care of. He wants you to be delivered from the things that ail you, from the, from the sins that hold you back, from the things that so easily beset. He wants you to be delivered. Listen, he wants to provide for us what we need, and he provides what he needs. See, what he needs is a victorious warrior. What he needs is somebody that's going to trust him. What he needs is somebody that's going to walk in the stability that Jesus died to give to you and I. I'm telling you the truth this morning. Amen. I don't know how it's going over in your head and in your heart. I know we're probably tired. It's early on a Sunday morning. But what I'm telling you is the truth. There is stability in Christ. Amen. He is the rock upon which we stand. So God's trying to provide some things for himself. God's at work on this earth, my friend. Even though it doesn't look like it. I need you to know that God's at work. And he's bringing it to a fruition. He's going to bring it to its end. I'm telling you, it's going to happen. Just like he came the first time, he's coming. Praise God. And look, his will for us can be found where the two intersect. I know, I was just doing something fancy here. See, God's will for his kingdom. God's will for me. And listen, whenever I find those two spots right there. That's God's will. That's God's will. How does it, my God's will? I, I can't say this enough, friend. I'm trying to help you out. That when we make decisions based on what we believe is best for us without the understanding that we need to involve God in it, we're going to keep on making decisions that are going to keep on causing confusion, chaos, and frustration. I hope that makes sense. All right. There's a long backstory here. We already talked about it, right? God has provided for himself a king of his choosing. He allowed Israel to choose Saul, and that was not his will. He allows people to make decisions for their own lives, many times even though it's not his will for their, for their lives. He allows it because, let me tell you why, he created you with a free will. He, I just like to say it like this. You know, some of this is Matt's theological philosophy. You know, it's like God doesn't want robots. God wants, he gave you a gift and it's called a free will. And you know what he wants you to do? 
what his heart's desire for you to do is for you to take that free will and to give it back to him. Amen. In the midst of all these other things that are going on, in the midst of all these other options that you could give your free will to, God's desire is that you give that free will back to him. That's one of the things that I would try to say all the time when I say God doesn't have any grandchildren. It's like, what does that mean? You can raise your children in the ways of the Lord, and you should. I mean, I got, can I tell you something that is not the church's responsibility to raise your children in the ways of the Lord? Right. You know what the church is supposed to do? The church is supposed to provide an environment that teaches the truth, that prepares children. But no, you know, Danielle was telling me yesterday, she said that she saw an illustration one time where people always want to blame. I mean, listen, I'm not talking about anybody blaming this church. That's not what I'm trying to say. But where they, they do, they'll, they'll blame the church. Oh, well, you ain't got this right. You ain't got that right. You ain't da 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 And, you know, and it had to do with their kids. And it was like this, this big old container of cheese puffs. Like all the way up to the ceiling, and then there was this little bitty thing of cheese puffs. And, and, the, and the illustration was our time with your kid, your time with your kid. Yeah, how many times, like, this ain't even in my message, but you know what? Free will, giving your free will back over to God, training your children up in the ways of the Lord so that they understand their free will to give back to God. So, yeah, it is all connected. How many times, you know? Do, do people believe that it's the church's responsibility? How many times do, do parents come into the church and they themselves aren't really serving the Lord? And I'm not picking on people because Lord knows I've had my own string of problems as a Christian and, you know, still ain't got it all figured out. Lord help me, right? But I'm just trying to make a point. People that just straight up blatantly ain't serving the Lord. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? Is it okay if we be real? They still up in the world. They got one foot in the world and they come into church and they're acting like they all holy and all that. And I'm not trying to, listen, well, what are you saying, preacher? People don't struggle. That's not what I'm saying. I've struggled big time as a Christian. What I'm trying to say, though, is the mentality behind it. You understand? Whenever people are puffed up about where they think that they are when in reality they're not. See, a person that knows they're not right, in their heart there's a level of humility connected to that. And anyway, they're going to blame everybody else for why things turn out the way they did when in reality it was really more about them and the decisions that they made. And now, can I tell you, I know I didn't do everything right with our kids. You know, things didn't always turn out, things didn't turn out exactly so far. The, the story's not over. Amen. It in my mind. But I know for a fact that I raised my children and Danielle and I raised our children in a way where Jesus was the forefront of our home. You know, and, and, and the world tries to come in and tries to pull them out. But, but again, he ain't got no grandchildren. They got to come with their free will. That's where I was going with their free will. And they got to give it back to the Lord. Amen. See, he gives you a gift of free will, but guess what? You got to give that gift back to him. You got to willingly say, Lord, I've come to the realization. I went out there on my little journey. And I realize now that, that what I really want is you. Because see, everything else has left me empty, Lord. I've been through this travel, what they call the aborigines, the walkabout. I went on my walkabout. And I realized that everything I tried to fill myself with, it just left me empty. And now it's you I want, oh Lord. Please forgive me. Fill, fill my heart with your presence. Amen. So, so God has a king of his choosing. He allowed Israel to pick Saul because they had a free will. And he allowed them to do that, but it wasn't his will. And look, this is what he told them earlier in the, in the book. He says, in, in that day, talking about when you pick Saul. In that day you will cry out because of your king. Whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. We make our own choices. And then we're not, we want to blame God, right? Am I telling the truth? We want to blame God, but it wasn't the Lord. We, we, we made our own choices. And then, we, and then we're miserable many times with the choices that we make. Amen? But, but look, and, and, and I got to tell you that. Amen? He, he doesn't always answer you. Because he ended up answering them. Is he not really answering them? He's answering them by giving them David, right? Is he not? But what I'm trying to tell you is he ain't never going to answer you when you think he's going to answer you. Amen. 
I, I wish that there was a way that I could really explain it without using so many words, but one of the things that the Lord showed me before is this, is that, you know, son, part of the problem is, is that people think that they're at the end when they start crying out. Oh, this is really it, Lord. I don't want no more of this. And he's like, but what they what they need to realize is, is that I'm the creator of their soul. I created them. I know every little neuron through the synapse and every little thought, every chemical thought that moves through their brain. And they think that they done, but I know when you're done. I know when you're ready. I know when you cry out to me in the midst of your emptiness and you cry out. And I know when to show up and to, and to do the work. Amen. But he said, you're going to cry out because of what you chose for yourself. But like Israel, we want to bake our own bread, right? Many times we want to bake our own bread. So again, Bethlehem, I know I already told y'all this means house of bread. God's doing some work in Bethlehem. He's baking some bread. See, God provided himself a king. God provided his people a king, right? And God provides. I want you to know that. And I want you to remember that. God provides. And so whatever it is that you need this morning, I got to tell you, you might not get it exactly when you want it, but I want you to know that God does provide. But can we perceive? Can we understand what God's doing? And, and it's a legitimate question. It's a legitimate question that, that all Christians should ask. Can we properly Perceive what he provides. Yeah. Point number two. Between God and the world. And it's just a question. I'm not saying that you can't. I know that all of us are at various levels of our walk, right? And some people are very sensitive to the voice of God. Other people maybe not as sensitive, but it doesn't mean that they don't want to be. But the question that I'm asking is, is that can we perceive what God wants versus what we want? Can we even tell the difference between God in the world. I kind of like ended up thinking, you know what? I like words. And so let's, let's, let's change that word perceive right there. Let's, let's talk about discern because, you know, discernment has to do with the spirit of God. Yeah. I believe that to be able to discriminate the difference between the two. If you don't have the spirit of God speaking to you and a willingness to listen to what God is saying, you will still forge forward with what it with what, what your plans are does that make sense so so because sometimes what we think is god's will is not really god's will and listen can we be honest sometimes it's confusing yeah. right i mean let's just be real sometimes god's will versus our will can be confusing we may want something so badly and we can find scripture to justify our actions so it becomes very confusing right we, we have a desire in our heart and so, and we can find scripture to justify the choices that we make. Well, we'll give me some examples. Okay, well, a classic example is people getting, getting married too quickly and maybe even sometimes maybe marrying the wrong person for the wrong motives. But the word of God says that a man that finds a wife finds a good thing. The, the word of God says it's good for, for, for a man and a woman to come together. I'm not questioning any of that. I believe that. But also wrapped up in there can be the flesh. Yeah. And, and, and that the whole thing is being built on something that is not really the Spirit of God. But yet I can find scripture to justify the actions that I'm making. Now listen, once, once, you, once you get married in the eyes of the Lord, it, you're, it's supposed to, the Lord can work things out whenever they don't go the way that they're going to go. But one thing that I got to tell you is this, and I've shared this with somebody else in, in the fellowship you can't control the actions of another person. It hurts. It's painful. I don't understand. I thought that when we came together that we, that we loved one another. What's, what's happened in this situation? You can't control the actions and the behavior of another human being. And many times whenever people open up those certain doors with their free will and they go in a certain direction, guess what? They keep on going and they think that they're okay. The whole time as they continue to travel down the path that they're traveling, they still think they're okay. Yeah. I could really start preaching hard on that. You, you know what I'm saying? Like the decisions that people make that are contrary to the word of God, yet continue to act like everything's completely normal and that nothing wrong has been done. 
And it doesn't work that way. Amen. That doesn't mean that God's not a restorer. It doesn't mean that God can't reconcile. It doesn't mean that God can't heal because he is. That's what he does. He's in the business of healing. But at the same time, God is speaking specific things through his word. And sometimes God's will can be confused, right, with our will. I mean, sometimes jobs. I have a long story. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. I've shared it before. But I got offered a job one time. And it was $10,000 more a year. And I was kind of at that time. And I went and asked two spiritual leaders their opinion. And they're like, well, I'm, yeah, you're supposed to go take that job. But the whole time I had this weird feeling in my gut. Like it just wasn't right, right? God was trying to contend with me, but I just kept forging forward, man, $10,000 more. My gut would get even more so. It was like a gnawing at my stomach. Long story short, I didn't go take that job. And guess what? No, it wasn't two years. It was one year later. That whole clinic shut down. The whole thing shut down. See, that's the good, I, I wasn't planning on saying this, but I want you to know something. You serve the God that has foreknowledge. Amen. Yes. He knows the beginning from the end. Do you believe that? Yes. He can speak to you and he's trying to speak to us on the inside. But can we perceive, can we discern the difference between what God wants for our lives and what we want? Because see, sometimes what God wants is it, it might come back around and the things that we wanted we end up with, yeah. I want a nicer house. God's not opposing you having a nicer He's really not. But if that's the focal point of your life, yeah. you're missing it. Right? Yeah. I need a nicer car. God's not opposed to you having a nicer car. But if that's the focal point of your life, you're missing it. Material possessions, the cares of the world will choke out the seed of the gospel from your life. Yeah. Yeah. See, God will give you those things. But what about what God wants? He wants his will and our will to intersect. There we can find his will for our lives. So it can become very confusing, right? The only way to discern the difference is to be able to hear the voice of God and to be willing to surrender to the voice of truth. It's kind of like a test. God will bring you along piece by piece, step by step. He will allow situations to take place to, to reveal to you more and more so that you can become sensitized to his voice. Does that make sense? Like, I mean, if you've been around somebody long enough and you might be around the corner and you hear their voice, you recognize them, right? Whereas somebody that you just met, you might not recognize their voice. God will, he's merciful like that. It doesn't seem like mercy when you're going through the trial, but he's allowing these things to take place so that we can become more familiar with what he is speaking. Amen. Look at this, 1 John 2.20. Now I'm going to be honest with you, I don't like the NIV translation too much, but every now and then, the NIV hits it better. It's, it gets the meaning, captures the thought, all right? And that's really, I don't mean to do a big old study on translations, but that's really the kind of translation it is. It's a thought for thought, okay? Whereas the King James is a word for word. I prefer word for words, but in this way, the word in the King James was unction, and in the NIV, the word is anointing, all right? And what I need you to know is that the idea here is really anointing. Now, unction, come to find out, meant the same thing way back in the day, but it's changed a little bit. Unction, to me, at least whenever, now when I looked it up in the American Dictionary, it really had more of the idea of anointing, but when I hear the word unction, I feel... I think of like a compulsion or something like leading me in a certain direction. And, and, and in a way, yes, that's what's happening. But anointing, the word in the Greek is charisma. It means to be smeared. The idea is being smeared just like David was. I didn't really make that connection when I was writing. Just like David was poured upon with a horn of oil when he was anointed. That is the idea behind charisma in the Greek New Testament. It means a smearing like with oil, but it's symbolic of the Holy Spirit. So when the anointing of God is with you, right? And, and what, what, how does the anointing of God happen? When you get saved, the spirit of God, the anointing of God comes to live on the inside of you. 
Now, we believe in a second work of grace called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, amen, where you're filled to overflowing. And yes, the initial physical evidence is that you will speak in other tongues, but that's not the purpose of the baptism. The purpose of the baptism is for power. For power for what? So that you will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the outermost part of the earth. You can't be a witness for the Lord without the power of the Holy Spirit. You're, you're going to fail time and time again, but if you be filled with the Holy Spirit, you will have a power source on the inside of you to accomplish what God has called you to do. But look right here, this is talking about kind of like a little bit of a different aspect of the anointing. The Holy Spirit in you. See, you have an anointing from the Holy One and all of you know the truth. You have an option from the Holy One and you know the truth. That means if you and I are being discerning, if we're able to hear the voice of God, that means that as we navigate this journey called life, $10,000, that's a no-brainer. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, no, it is. You need to put your brain on this, son. You need to not, not just not your cerebral brain, but you need to put your spiritual mind on this because I'm trying to tell you something different than what makes sense to the logical world. You remember whenever Paul said to the Corinthians, he said the natural mind or the natural man cannot perceive the things of God. That's right. There's, look, you have an anointing from the Holy One and all of you know the truth. It's kind of like an illustration. This is the illustration. It's like a nursing test question. I'm, I know I'm just going to enter y'all into my other little world here. When I was in nursing school, they made this big old deal about critical thinking. We want to teach you how to think critically. Okay, and, and, and so I can remember because yeah, I was a mess when I was in nursing school. I was saved, but oh Lord, that flesh was still alive and well. I know y'all think I'm still full of it, but look, it was bad. Okay, and they give us the opportunity to question their test questions after the test. Oh Lord, that was a mistake because here comes Matt. You know, I'm like, well, wait, hold on a second. You know, and I'm like, I can't think of a specific instance, but clearly pathophysiologically da 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 and this is correct this test and answer number b was right yes but c was more right <laughs> c was more right matt and what we needed you to do was to be able to discern or to perceive the more correct question and you didn't do that and so therefore minus two <laughs> And, and, and it's kind of like the same thing in the spiritual realm, but not physical, spiritual. You're going through things, and, and but this is right according to the Word of God. Yes, but this is more right because the Spirit of God, through the Word of God, is telling you something different than what your flesh wants. And He's trying to contend with you, and He's trying to speak to you. Amen? Hopefully that makes sense. So here we go are back at, at, at this, and it says, And it came to pass... When they were come, then he looked on Eliab and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. So, so again, I already alluded to the fact that Eliab was tall. He was of greater statue, stature, right? He was taller. And so he looked apart. Now we're going to, we're going to dig down a little bit deeper right here. I'm about to, I'm about to bring some stuff to you that you might not have known that you was going to get on a Sunday morning, but I'm trying to make a point. All right. And, and, and so here's the next scripture. But the Lord said to Samuel, look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord sees not as man sees, for man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Now, already I made this point that the world is looking at stuff outwardly. The world prepares something in society and gives us a picture of this and says, this is what's normal. Even, listen, can I, can I tell you that it's sad, but, but it's true? I feel like the Lord's calming me down a little bit. It's sad, but it's true that the world has entered into the church. Do, do we understand that? I hope, you, I hope you're with me. I hope you don't think that I'm just some mean guy that's getting old and ornery. I mean, that might be true too, but I'm just trying to say that the world, the spirit of the world has... Not, not crept in, been invited in. Yeah. The spirit of the world has been invited into the church. Lord help us. Yes. And, and, and so what we're seeing as what was being called the church is not really always the church. That's 
And, and many times we're, we're, we're under the impression that if it's a small congregation of 25, 30 people, that must not be the Lord. Because whenever we look, through, look at old boy over here in Houston, man, he got 35,000. Old boy over here and such and such, he got 20,000. Look, surely I even thought that whenever the Lord first got a hold of me. He must be doing something right. He got 50,000. But what about whatever Jesus in John chapter 6 says? My flesh is true meat. My blood is true drink. Disciples, will you leave me too? Mm -hmm. Reality is, is that most people don't want to hear the truth at the level that it confronts them. Listen, I've learned something too. I don't even like correction. Is it, can I be true? Now, I want to love correction. Yes. Because see, the, the Bible says the fool hates And I want to be the wise man. I want the correction of the Lord to be something like a treasure that I can embrace. Because the Lord wants to correct me and he wants to put, he wants to heal me. Amen. So he said, don't look, but I'm, I'm trying to make a point. I wish there was more that I could say, but we don't have time to say that. And listen, even the wickedness of the world, listen, I'm not trying to get all off and all that kind of stuff right now. I love talking about it, but I'm just even, even the image that the world broadcasts with governments and all of the things, whatever your position is on Corona. I know I got a strong opinion about that, you know. I believe that this world, listen to me, I'm going to just say this right now. This is not end time stuff right now, but listen, the Bible says it. I believe that this world right now through all of this is being prepared for something else. Amen. Amen. Yes, God has a plan and he's preparing our hearts for what he has planned. But before his plan comes to pass, something else is coming before it. And it isn't going to be good, my friend. And this world is being prepared for that right now. The, 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 the. I, don't, I can't think of the right word. I'm looking for the, the resolve of the human heart is tr they're trying to break it down. Yeah. They're trying to break it down. I believe that. Mm -hmm. Think I'm crazy all you want. And, 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 and what I need you to know is that the way that they broadcast it in the world is they flip the script. They make it think that if you don't want to do everything exactly the way that they want you to do it, then you're the problem. No, sir, I'm not the problem. Your system is the problem because you're being led by the spirit of Antichrist. And it's a smoke and mirror show. It's the appearance of the world. And what I'm trying to tell you is that God's warning us. Man looks at the outward appearance and it, on a small scale to a big scale. But I'm looking at the inside. God's got a plan that he's moving. God's people see it their way and not his. Look at this. Manna from heaven. Right? What happened whenever God gave? I've given you provision from heaven. Children of Israel in the exodus, wandering in the wilderness. God <laughs> provides them manna from heaven. A type of Christ that would come later. And what do they say? We loathe this bread that you give us. Give us flesh to eat. <laughs> Boy, there's a whole other message right there. Give a, and you know what it says in the psalm? You allowed quail to light upon the camp. They ate so much flesh that they vomited out of their nose. Is that not a perfect spiritual type right there? You don't want the bread of heaven, which is what God gave, which is Jesus, ultimately. Instead, you want flesh. You want what you want. Okay, well, you get what you get. And you're going to vomit it out your nose. You're going to get tired of it, right? So look, so many times God's people see it their way. And that is Lot's green grass. Y'all remember that story? Bible says that Abraham and Lot got so big they had to divide. And Abraham says, take what you want. He says, he looked at the plain of Jordan. It was well watered. He thinks, I got sheep, green grass. That's the place I need to go. Logical thinking. The natural man cannot perceive the things of God. He finds himself in the valley of the Jordan. Next thing you know, he's camped near Sodom. Next thing you know, he's at the gate. He's a politician in Sodom. Man's mindset and his decisions that he makes are so oftentimes contrary to the way God sees it. Saul for a king. Here we go. Give us a king. Right? And so in the midst of all of this, so many times God's people cannot see things his way. Now Samuel was about to do it again. You see that? After all of these things, see Samuel's about to do it again because he sees Eliab. He sees this stature of this young man. And listen, we just went through Saul. You understand that? Look, I need, I need you to understand this part right here. Our flesh is susceptible to seeing what the world sees and wanting what the world wants. Amen? I hope that makes sense. 
It's about to start all over again. Even Samuel's about to choose a king based on what's impressive to the world's standards. Now, we're about to break that down for a second. Okay, just hang tight. A king based on what's impressive to the world's standards instead of what impresses God. You see, the scripture says about Saul. I want you to see this. So, we want a king. And you listen, let me give you the context again. I forgot to tell you this earlier. In Judges, they said, we want a king like the other nations. So this is how, this is one of the things that we see about Saul. So they ran and they took him from there. We're talking about Saul right now. And when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. Now listen, you might miss this if you're just reading through the Bible. You will miss this if you have a preacher that's unwilling to talk about these things. But the Lord has already revealed to me it, way in the past, and he continues to reiterate it. You're not to protect him from my word. They don't need to protect him from my word. They need to know my word. And if you don't know all the details of the word of God, see, back in the day, whenever I used to first start talking about Genesis 6, people were like, you don't need to talk about that kind of stuff in the church because people aren't ready for that. No, let me tell you something. How are you going to understand what's going on here if you don't understand the concept of Genesis 6? We're about to talk about it. All right. Saul was tall. Eliab was tall. All the other nations had tall kings. The world has an appearance. The church many times is duped into believing that whatever the world has, that's what we want. In order to understand the context, you must understand the previous history of the Bible. You must understand the ancient world that these people live in, the worldview that they had. And you can go back and you can do some study on this in the book of Deuteronomy, Joshua, the Psalms. The kings of the other nations many times were what we call Nephilim. All right. If you go back to Genesis 6 and you read the story, what you learn is, and listen, I can prove this in the New Testament. I can prove this through the letter from Peter. I can prove this through the letter uh, of Jude. This is proven within the New Testament. That there's terminology that we can break down that proves what I'm about to tell you. That according to Genesis chapter 6, the sons of God, which describes fallen angels, came down and commingled with the daughters of men. How did they do that? Listen, we don't, wanna, we don't have time to break that down. What we're told in the Word of God. See, when I was in Bible college, they don't even teach that. They're like, oh no, that was... That was Cain's sons. That was with uh, Seth's, uh, Seth's daughters. Well, how did it produce Nephilim? Because the word Nephilim means giant. See? So now this is where we are now. How did Cain, who was fallen, with Seth's daughters produce giants in the land? These giants wreak havoc. My friend, next week, as a matter of fact, if I'm preaching next week, what we're going to see is David's going to bring one down. The, the, the giants of the land were evil, wicked, hybrid, half-breeds, a mixture of angel and human being. How it all went down, I don't really know. I'm here to tell you what the word of the Lord says, and the most famous one was known as Og of Bashan. Now, these disembodied Nephilim are what we call demon spirits. You're still contending against them. Spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. You just can't see them now. And Og of Bashan was really one of the most famous ones. That's where we, I think this is where we get the idea of the king of the king size bed. Because it talks about his bed. It talks about his bed. Is his bed not still there? I believe it was Ramoth Gilead or wherever the place was. The children of Israel were so familiar with Og because he is repeatedly mentioned throughout their scriptures. Deuteronomy, Joshua, Psalms. Og of Bashan, Og of Bashan, the children of Israel, God gave them the power to defeat them. But what I'm trying to show you is a clip in God's salvation history, that part of this. Why would these fallen angels cohabit with the daughters of men? Because the proclamation in the garden said to the serpent, the seed of the woman will crush your head. Now an immediate response of darkness to try to corrupt the seed of the woman. To try to corrupt the plan of salvation. I know that that's a lot, but you got to just trust me in this. Amen? 
Well, you don't have to. You need to go study up for yourself. <laughs> because the other nations had tall kings, and because God's people can't help themselves and want what the world wants, they wanted Saul, who was tall, and now Samuel is going to do it again with Eliab. But the Lord speaks, and Samuel hears. Boy, that's some good stuff. And as a matter of fact, probably the, in the next third time I preach from here, we're going to talk about Samuel hearing. But in the meantime, I want to give you two quick thoughts about Samuel hears. Number one, in the Colossians 3.15, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. See, Samuel was going to, to, he looks at Eliab, he looks the part, he can't even help himself. Saul was tall, Og was tall, all the nations have tall kings. Surely he's the one, he meets the part, but guess what happened? The Lord broke through and said, I have refused him. And Samuel felt that thing in his before. And I know that you felt that unction from the Holy One, that anointing from the Holy One that was telling you, don't turn there, turn that way. Don't go there, don't say that. Don't do that, right? And, 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 and he was contending. See, this scripture right here says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. I want you to know I love this scripture because that word rule right there in the Greek, you know what it means? It means to umpire. Let the peace of God be the umpire. I told somebody the other day, they were like, man, you know, why don't you come on over here all the, full time? And I said, well, I'm not saying that that won't be right now, though. I ain't feeling it. I don't feel the peace. I told them. I don't feel the peace. You may not understand that completely, but I don't feel the peace. I don't have a release. I'm, uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to jump. I don't, see, I haven't been there. <laughs> I've been down that road. I don't want to go back to that. If it's God's will, I'm all about it. If it's not God's will, I don't care what it looks like, what it sounds like. I don't want it. Because, see, sometimes it is God's will. It's just not his timing. Amen. And we just rush in like gangbusters. Boom, let's make this thing happen. We're about to, like, you know, bark in order. You do this. You do that. We're going to make this happen. We're going to build this kingdom, baby. And then next thing you know, boop, it all comes crumbling down. Because I tried to start a restaurant in my own strength. Right? And I mean, I felt it. All right, here we go. Samuel heard God as a little boy. I want you to know that. We'll, we'll get into it a little bit more. Even his name, that's your homework. Go home and study the name. Samuel heard God as a little boy. And I want you to know this. Hearing the voice of God grows through sensitivity. See, the more you recognize it and the more you surrender to that voice, the more clear it gets, the more you grow in your ability to hear the voice of God. The opposite is true. The more that we reject that voice, the more we choose to push that voice on the back burner, guess what? It becomes, you, well, I'm going to preach it in a couple weeks, but you become more like Eli. Your vision gets dim. You can't see the spirit of God, the spirit, what God's doing. You can't hear what God's saying as clearly because we've been rejecting what God's been trying to say. So here we go. We're at the end. Singers, musicians, if y'all could uh, come forward. I always want to leave worshiping the Lord. Amen. Manuel, I'm throwing you a curveball. Would you go in, in there and would y'all grab the communion stuff for me? And look, we're going to pick it up after the after everybody's done worshiping the Lord with the long last song. Praise God. We'll pick up the cups after everybody's done worshiping the Lord. I know I went long. I always go long. I still say we only come to church twice a week. So God is baking bread in Bethlehem. Amen? The house of bread. What, what a beautiful, look, God doesn't miss any, God doesn't miss any, uh, any moment, amen, uh, God's baking bread in, a, in, in Bethlehem, look, not just D David, but Jesus, amen, he planned this whole thing out, I mean, what, how awesome is God, that there would be a, a little town called Bethlehem, that would mean house of bread, and that for thousands of years before, he would prepare a king named David from the lineage of which his Christ would one day come. And along the way, he would cause bread to rain from heaven. And he would give all these types until finally it comes to where Jesus is born in Bethlehem. The fulfillment of bread born in the house of bread. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. This is God is so good. Thank you, sir. 
Why don't you hand it to the people, sir, if you don't mind. I appreciate that. Through Jesus, God has placed his spirit in us. The spirit provides the unction, the anointing, so that we can know his truth. Now, you know me. As we're, as we're passing out the bread, y'all can softly play while I'm talking, if you don't mind. I'm all about words. I love words. Sometimes maybe I pay too much attention to words. But I want you to know that in the, in the New Testament, it talks a lot about in Christ, through Christ. You see that word right there, through Christ? Look, I put this little line through Christ because I want you to see that there's meaning in these words in the New Testament. And whenever it says through Jesus or through Christ, God placed his spirit in us. What it's really talking about is, it's talking about not just through who he was, but through what he did. And again, when we talk about the cross, we need to understand it's not talking about two pieces of wood. It's talking about spiritually what God accomplished through Jesus and through what he did for us on the cross. Well, what did he do? He's the bread of heaven that had no sin. He came to earth and he offered that sinless life on the cross as payment for sin. And whenever you believe that by faith, the Spirit of God comes to live on the inside of you. And now the work that God desires to do in you, he does through what Jesus has already done. He's clothed you in righteousness. Now listen, when we take communion, this is our remembrance of what Jesus came to do for us on the cross. People that take communion are supposed to be born again believers. Because it doesn't make any sense for you to eat this bread or drink from this cup if, you have, if you're not a believer. Because what you're doing whenever you do this is remembering what Jesus did for you. Right? So if you're not, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you can invite him into your heart right now, praise God, and, and we can take communion together. But what this cup represents, it represents the bread that came from heaven, and, that, and, the, and, the, and the cup represents the blood that was shed on the cross. And if you're going to drink of this cup and eat of this bread, then what you're saying is, Lord, I know I'm a sinner, and I know that I needed you to die for me, and so I'm going to remember what you did for me, and I'm going to celebrate this moment with you. When we take communion, I know I'll wear it out, but listen, it's a compound word, common union. See, you and I have a common union if we're believers. The common union that we have is that we have believed that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. So listen, if you're not a believer right now in the name of Jesus, if you want to, you don't have to. You can just, you can just stick this in your, in your pocket and, and, and you, know, you can just do it if that's what you choose to do. So don't ever be pressured into anything. Jesus said you must count the cost. But if you're not a believer, if you're watching on video, maybe you got some crackers and some juice in your house and you say, well, I've never believed in Christ before, but something that you said, something is ready. I can see my life and where it's going and the things that I've done and the times that I didn't feel right about. It. So, Lord, I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. I don't understand it all. But, the, but the, I feel like the Holy Spirit was speaking to my, to my, my stomach or speaking to my deep down within me like he was talking about it. That's you. All you got to do is invite him in. All you got to do is say, Jesus, come into my heart. Right now, Jesus, come into my heart and forgive me of my sin. I'm inviting you in. I'm asking you to have your way. I believe that what you did on the cross for me was enough. Save me from my sin. Fill me with your spirit. Do the work needs to be done. Lead me and guide me in the right direction. Listen, I'm going to just tell you right now, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it from your heart, I'm telling you right now, your life will never be the same. It might just start small and grow big. It might be an immediate conversion that you get set on fire. But I'm telling you right now, if you've been business with God, God knows you've been business and his spirit will be on the inside of you. His spirit's going to be on the inside of you. If you got saved, if you if you believed in your heart and confessed with your mouth, then you can go ahead and you can peel off this cellophane and you can take this bread right here, which represents the sinless 
body of Jesus. Jesus said, this bread is my body, it shall be broken for you. Father, I'm asking you to bless this bread. I thank you that throughout the word of God, you gave us the type of bread. Because you were preparing your people in this world to know that you were going to send us bread in Bethlehem. Father, I ask that you bless this bread. In Jesus' name, let's eat it together. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus. See, this cup, Jesus said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant. This cup is the cup of the new covenant. His blood was shed for us. It represents his blood and the fact that he died on the cross to save us from our sin. It was a sacrifice. That's what the blood represents. It represents the life of the creature. That's what the Bible says in Leviticus. The, the life of the cre creature is in the blood. His blood was poured out. His life was given. His life was paid. was a ransom that paid his sinless life paid a ransom for our sinful life. Father, I ask you to bless this cup that represents the blood of your only begotten Son. And I pray, O oh Lord God, that your grace would flow, Lord God, as we remember the cross, as we remember the work of Jesus, the fulfillment of all those years of human history brought to us in Christ. Bless this cup as we drink it together in Jesus' name. They're going to lead us in a song, amen. Let's worship the Lord and let's think about, let's think about the cross. Let's think about what God has done for us, amen. And let's worship him because he's the Lord.